Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today is September the 11th, 2022. The day that we remember 9-11 terrorist attacks. Because of that, today we're celebrating Patriot Day. So in light of the 9-11 terrorist attacks in America over two decades ago, we will be talking about being prepared for enemy attacks by building on the firm foundation. On September the 11th, 2001, everything changed for travelers. More restrictions, more security checks, more inspections. The reign of terror from the skies lasted three hours as terrorists flew two planes into the World Trade Center in New York. One plane into the Pentagon at Arrington, Virginia. Another crash in Pennsylvania, apparently headed for the White House. Nearly 3,000 people lost their lives as a result of the attacks, and many others suffered ongoing health conditions for injuries and smoke inhalation. Besides these indirectly affected from the attack, Countless others suffered emotionally as they mourned the loss of lost loved ones, family members, close friends, and co-workers. Others lamented the enormous loss of life, although they themselves did not know anyone personally who had died as a result of the attacks. Those calloused, calculated, unprovoked attack, and and the needless loss of life that day. For the countless many who remember the events of 9-11 will remember it as the day the war on terrorism began and the day that travel changed forever. I can remember as a young man when we were still able to walk down the concourses and and we could walk our loved ones right up to the gate and watch them walk down and board the plane, board their flights. Or we could wait at the gate and greet our family members and friends as they disembark the plane and just walk through the gate. The weeks following 9-11, there was a spike in church attendance as Americans fought to come to terms with what had just happened. Whether the churches were not ready or the church leaders were ill-prepared to deal with the spontaneous influx of parishioners, I'm not sure. But the rush to church was short-lived as the dust of 9-11 settled and the smoke cleared and the raw memory began to scab over. Although the memory of that fateful morning grows distant in the rearview mirror of our memories, we should never lose sight of the ever-present spiritual war that is ever before us and ever around us. Paul understood that very well and instructed us to put on the whole armor or the full armor of God, so that we will be able to stand against the plots and the plans of the devil, whose sole aim is to trip us up, knock us off course, and to take us down. Now, let us get into our message, the firm foundation. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Last, but certainly not least, Paul said, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We do not rely on our own strength, nor do we submit to our own weaknesses or our own frailties. But we strengthen ourselves 
in the strength of the might of our God, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, so that when we are weak, then we are strong, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. But how do we do that? How do we strengthen ourselves in our weaknesses? It all starts with the love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who with his own blood purchased all mankind for God. And he called out of the masses an ecclesia, the church, the body of Christ. We are to love him. We are to worship him. We are to call upon his name. We are to put him first and foremost and above all things. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus himself said that he will build his church, his ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now we don't have time this morning to go into what Jesus actually meant by that statement, since it's beyond the scope of this message. But watch for a video explaining that in the coming weeks. What I do want you to understand though, is that it is not a finite, weak pebble as Peter that Jesus said that he would build his mighty church upon. That would make Peter equal with God because he would be the foundation of everything that Jesus is building. That would make him worthy of worship worthy of praise, which we know for a fact that that is not the case. Why? Answer me. Why? Why? Why would Jesus build his mighty church on a faltering personality like Peter, whom Paul had to confront and correct? Now, please understand, I have a lot of respect for Peter, but not worship. For according to Peter himself, he was only a man. See Acts chapter 10, verse 26. If buildings are going to last, then they must be built on a firm and solid foundation. Peter certainly cannot be considered or described as a firm and solid foundation. Jesus told the parable identifying that firm and solid foundation. Look with me, please, at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. It says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Clearly, this rock, this foundation is not Peter, but Jesus. So what rock was Jesus referring to in the parable then? For that answer, we'll have to back up just a few verses to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus was asking his disciples, Hey, what's the latest talk on Facebook about me? What are they posting on Instagram? Or what are they tweeting about me? They they answered different things. They, they said different prophets from the Old Testament. They even said John the Baptist come back to life. 
But keep in mind that John the Baptist was alive and well when Jesus came into his ministry. So that answer was a little peculiar. It, it, it was a bit confusing. But however, Jesus dug a little bit deeper and he asked, but who do you say that I am? Maybe the other disciples remained silent because they thought that it was a trick question. Or maybe Peter just burst out that answer without even thinking. And, and long before the other disciples could even think it over, he just burst out with the answer. Regardless, the answer to Jesus' question on who he was and still is, is found in Peter's, Peter's answer, found in verse 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, bingo, you are absolutely right. Well said, Peter. You are indeed led by the Holy Spirit who has revealed this to you from my father. And you will doubtlessly be a great apostle. But. The crown jewel, the prize, the nugget of truth is here. I am the son of God. I am the great I am. And on this fact that I am both the son of man and the son of God, and the only way to the father, I am the resurrection and the life. On that fact, that rock, that nugget of truth, I will build my church. There's a war going on for the souls of men. An unseen war raging all around us that most people are unaware of. The only way to win this war is to dig in. Like the days of old when they, they, they fought wars and, and, and they had hand-to-hand -hand combat and soldiers had to dig trenches and they had to dig in to be safe. We too must dig in by digging into the Word of God. Then we must begin to build spiritual fort, fort, fortresses, spiritual forts and fortresses on the rock, which is Jesus, the belief that He is the Son of God, the second member of the Godhead, the Word that became flesh, a belief in His death and resurrection, a faith that he will come back for us one day. He will not leave us here forever, but he will come back to take us that where he is, there we shall be also. Armed with the word of God, we, are, we can prepare for war, spiritual war. And when enemies come against us, we can defeat him with the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. When sickness comes against us, we defeat it with the word of God. By his stripes, you are healed. When oppressive spirits come against us, we can cast them out in the name of Jesus. We are more than conquerors through Jesus who gives us the victory. But first, we must build a firm foundation that can withstand the test of the enemy. It can be likened to Japan's skyscrapers that are built to survive earthquakes. How, do you ask? Well, according to the BBC.com website, there are two main levels of resilience that engineers work towards. The first is to withstand smaller earthquakes. This can be likened to everyday challenges, everyday temptations, as we Christians need to have enough resilience to withstand the daily trials and temptation that the enemy throws our way. We don't stumble over the same things that we stumbled over yesterday, the day before, weeks ago, years now. We're stumbling over the same things. We are overcomers. We overcome them in the name of our God. They go on to say, and I quote, For this magnitude, any damage that requires repair is not acceptable. The building should be so well designed that it can escape these earthquakes unscathed. End of quote. If Japan builds their buildings 
and design their buildings to escape earthquakes and tremors unscathed, how much more should we, since we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? But we cannot do it without prayer. We cannot do it without Bible reading. We cannot do it without studying the scriptures and fellowship with God and with his people. The second level of resilience is, and I quote, withstanding extreme earthquakes, which are rarer, the bar is set by the great Kanto earthquake of 1923. This was a large earthquake of magnitude 7.9 that devastated Tokyo, Yokohama, and killed more than 140,000 people, end of quote. This can be likened to extreme temptation, persecution, even death because of the word of God. It can be likened to mortal illnesses of a loved one where our faith is, is taken to the brink. Anything that has an extreme impact in and on our lives. So to take a lesson from the Japanese engineer, they learned that for their buildings to survive the incredible forces of an earthquake, their buildings will need to absorb and that much of the seismic energy as possible. One engineer was quoted as saying, when the structure can absorb all the energy from the earthquake, it will not collapse, end of quote. Can you think about that for a second? Absorb all of the energy, but how, how, how do they do that? Let me quote. This mainly happens in a process called seismic isolation. The buildings or structures are put on a form of bearing or shock absorber, sometimes as simple as blocks of rubber about 30 to 50 centimeters, 12 to 20 inches thick, to resist the motions of the earthquake. Wherever the building columns come down to the foundation, they sit on these rubber pads, end of quote. Any time the building columns come down to the foundation, they sit on these rubber pads. Now, who is our foundation and what are these rubber pads? Jesus and his word are our foundation because Jesus is the word and his love and his mercy and his grace are our rubber pads. Therefore, we don't let words, situations, or circumstances knock us down. We let it all fall on the rubber pads, which is the love and the mercy of Jesus. For his grace is still sufficient for us even today in the times that we are living in. Paul likened the believer to a building being built on a firm foundation. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15 with me, please. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. According to Paul, in the 11th verse of the chapter we just read, Jesus Christ himself is our foundation. Verses 12 through 13 tells us that anyone can build 
on that foundation. It's not just reserved for the rich or just for the poor or just for Americans or, or Europeans or Caribbean people, Spanish, white, black. No, anyone can build on that foundation. However, verse 14 and 15 explains that the work will be tried with fire. Just like the skyscrapers in Japan are tested by earthquakes. If some buildings were built with inferior seismic energy observers, they would suffer damage, but would survive. Those buildings, though, that were built with all the necessary energy observing shocks did not sustain any damage at all. So it will be with the Christians who are built on the true and firm foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and who has built with the corrective or the correct motives and love, etc., while doing what it is that they're doing for the Lord. Those Christians must be grounded in truth. They must be grounded in love, devoted to God and the things of God and to the people of God. Once we do everything to the glory and with all to the glory of God and with all love, our building will withstand the shaken and the test. When we were attacked by the enemy, as the World Trade Center was attacked we will be safe because Proverbs chapter 8 verse 10 tells us the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. At the mighty name of Jesus, diseases are healed. Demonic spirits are cast out. Relationships are restored. Mountains are moved. Souls are saved. And the breach is repaired. We're now reconciled back to God through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just like those pads are the buffer for Japan's skyscrapers, the name of the Lord is the buffer between us and the world. The hurtful words, the relentless persecution, even all the harassment is not aimed at us. It's actually aimed at Jesus himself. When your foundation is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, you do not let circumstances dictate your mood. You do not let feelings order your worship. You do not let disappointments conduct your mood or your joy. Your affirmation and your joy comes from your relationship with, with God, not your relationship with people. If anyone or anything is dictating your temperament or your disposition, then cut that someone out of your life. Remove that something from your repertoire. Get it out of your life. So here is the conclusion of the matter. Psalms 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But we cannot do that unless he is a firm foundation. So begs the question, are you building on that firm foundation? Is your hope in Jesus? Have you made him Lord and Savior of your life? If you haven't, here's how. All you got to do is to ask. Say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to build my life on the firm foundation, on the rock. That when the rains fall, the winds blow, and the flood rises, I will stand firm. Help me to love you with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind. And I give you thanks for that free gift of grace, that free gift 
of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to buy a Bible or get your Bible off your bookshelf and begin to read that Bible every single day. Highlight the verses that are meaningful to you. Memorize those verses. Join a church that believes in, in the Holy Spirit, believes in Jesus, believes in God the Father, believes that, that He still has the power to save, sanctify, and fill you with the Holy Spirit, that still believes that He's still a healing God. He still cast out demonic spirits and evil spirits. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when he comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of your Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever and ever. What an exciting time that will be. When we'll be reunited with our loved ones who have gone on before who have died in Jesus. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you. The Lord bless you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.